Hi, everyone. I always appreciate the uh, second day of the campus. People still showing up, so thank you very much. Um, you know, it's, it, I think sometimes you're just lucky um, in how things sort of play out. Uh, but David and I did not talk at all uh, about our presentations. And, uh, it's going to be uh, interesting, I think, because a lot of the information that we'll talk about here um, actually will play into what David was talking about. And uh, I do a, another talk uh, about patient safety and uh, some of the risk factors that uh, us as human beings, how we make errors, you know, since Adam and Eve we've been making mistakes. And uh, uh, one of the uh, factors that influence human errors is the fact that we become uh, experts where we have a system in place and we just start trusting the system and things will work out and, uh, and, and we lose paying attention and get distracted. But when the uh, deep uh, horizon oil well blew up, before it blew up, there were people on the well who were saying, you know, there's something not right with this well. And they actually sent an email to the supervisors in London saying, hey, let's not open, let's not open the service well producing. Because something's wrong with it. And the, actually, the um, supervisors wrote back and said, Who cares about your concerns? It'll probably be fine. Go ahead and open it. Well, then they open it and close up. And in the investigation, BP never had a well explode. So they didn't think it was, they think it was ever going to happen. And in all my new cause analysis, is where people, you know, like when we do well site surgery or something, you sit the doctors and the nurses in the room afterwards and they're like, you know, God, can you believe we're going to have to happen? They just believe that the processes and the system is going to work and they didn't necessarily pay as much attention as they should be. And, and I think a lot of what David was talking about, people getting into the, the, the you know, stacking trays on top of trays or processing instruments a certain way. An infection hasn't happened, an infection hasn't happened, an infection hasn't happened, and then it happens and people are happy to happen. When you step back and you see uh, what uh, in the one line where we just get into routines and start trusting processes instead of uh, always being inquisitive and questioning. And so, what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the, the myths that we've been told as, as part of our training and onboarding uh, as uh, professionals, both in the afternoon and maybe even on the SPD. That if you really test it, it's really not something that's true. And how this talk uh, generated is back uh, when I was there in the president, there used to be a, a, a gala, a foundation gala, where they, they would raise money for scholarships. And uh, you would, you know, the president and president and board members, you would go to these gales and you would sit with industry representatives. And so one night at this there, was sitting with an industry representative who does instrument repair and processing. And so we had this conversation about why is it always the nurses fault? Like, you know, we think at some point there's a problem with the instrument. And so he wasn't a manufacturer, he was a guy who repaired other people's stuff. And he said, you would be surprised about all the problems that happen to the way things are designed and the way things are manufactured. And I'm like, really? Because what if you want to, want to come and learn about it, I'll be happy to teach you. And so Sharon McNair and I went down and we met with the engineers and we met with the people who do the repairing and stuff. And we learned a bunch of stuff that we, as nurses, we never know. And so what I'm going to try to do today in this talk is share with you, with you some of the knowledge uh, that we got from this conversation. So here are the objectives, and you know, but really the purpose of this talk is really to uh, give you some insights into the how and why sometimes the instruments will fail, and uh, some of the things that you can do to help uh, protect it. So what is an urban, uh, urban legend? Well, it's folklore, it's myth, it's misinformation that is believed to be true. And many times urban legends get their the belief that they're true because it's because the person who's telling you is someone who you trust or you, you give uh, respect to or, or um, credence to. 
Sometimes there could be the sales rep who's coming and selling you the, the product. Sometimes it could be the uh, periodical nurse who trains you and you pass that information you know, along down to you. And then it just gets, the, talk, the story gets told over and over and over again and then it becomes something that, that people believe. So when we do have urban legends uh, in the operating room, it, it can really impact on patient safety. Because if we don't have instrumentation that's working, and you guys know all this, is delays can happen, and when a delay happens, the patient's under anesthesia for an extended period of time, has a uh, more of a chance to develop pressure ulcers, has more of a chance to get an EBT. Um, if the instrument malfunctions during the case, you have the issue of tissue organ damage, you can have infection, as David was talking about, uh, he did a very good job of explaining how infections can happen. Uh, if we don't have properly cleaned or, or sterilized instruments. And, and I think this is really the most critical aspect of it because as I was talking earlier about distraction. If you have the surgeons and the team distracted, then we're not focusing on catching the things, the little signs and symptoms that something might be going wrong and, and miss it. I remember one time I was scrubbed in, uh, in a craniotomy. And we were in operating room eight. And through the walls in operating room seven, we could hear an orthopedic surgeon yelling and screaming about the instruments not being ready for his case. And at one point, he kicked the kick bucket and it banged against the wall. And so we're doing this training out, and the anesthesiologist says, Oh, thank God he didn't take room seven today. Even though those, those are private insurance patients, I just don't want to deal with Dr. So and so. And the circulating nurse said, yeah, they wanted to be coming up for lunch with me. And I said, oh, God, please, no. And when everybody, the resident sets up and says, I didn't know the surgeon said, stop it, that's it, I'm not. And he turns to me and he says, how? So I hand him a towel and he wraps his hands and he walks over to the operating room door and he looks at the circulating nurse. She opens the door and he walks out and he kicks the, the room seven door open and he says, uh, so doctor, can I talk to you? And of course, all of us are sitting our head like that. I'm just over looking at him. And he says, so the surgeon says, I don't care if you want to be here. I really don't care if you want to put your patient at risk. But when your behavior has my operating team, give your operating room instead of mine. That's a problem. And I'm recording this in case of this. So please behave so I can take care of my patient. You know, and that neurosurgeon was a hero to people in the operating room because he called it out for what it was, right? All of us were not doing surgery on this one brick. All of us were in the and watching the, the, the behavior there. But that's what happens when, you know, you have this, you don't have the instruments, right? You don't have any somebody who's not necessarily the best personality and mindset goes up and now the whole team is <laughs> There's a movie out, uh, uh, the Alita Brown, and uh, the uh, player, uh, Evelyn, she's an outfielder, with the she threw the ball home to home to try to get someone out, but it allowed, allowed runners to advance and they lose the lead. And so she comes running in from the field, and the coach, uh, Tom Hanks, says, Evelyn, can I talk to you? And uh, so many times I've had surgeons ask me this passive aggressive question before they start yelling at me. He says to her, What team do you play for? She's like, oh, I'm a peach. I'm just wondering why you went to the hall when you got to one thing, you must have been because they don't start thinking you said it. And she starts crying. But I heard some things and go, what hospital do you go to? My work for St. Joseph's. I was just wondering, why are my instruments? What are they wearing? You know, that same mindset. That same, uh, that same mindset. And so anyway, uh, he starts showing it, he starts crying. And if you look at that scene in the movie, everybody in the background, all the players are standing there watching this. No one's playing baseball. Everybody's distracted by this moment. And so all of these procedures can cause a patient harm and risk if we're not at the best of our game. And we saw the video clip from David where this man's life has changed because a simple processing of you know, instruments has caused this to get seven surgeries and not being able to use his arm and, and all that pain. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that could lead to instruments not being available. So let's start debunking some of these urgent uh, urban legends. So one drill, one case. During a procedure, a drill needs to be turned off after running continuously for how many minutes? Anybody want to guess? 20 minutes? 10 minutes? One minute. So one minute. So these are, you know, I'm, I also have no conflict of interest. I'm not going to talk about anybody's product, not anybody's name. So it's all the debunk. But these are, if, if David was talking about, you get instructions for use. If someone you buy a drill or something, you're going to get the operating manual that's thrown in a box and it's about this thing and nobody picks it up and reads it. But if you did, you would look at it and the, each of those manuals have what they call a duty site. And so manufacturer A produces three different power drills. And they say in their instructions, for every minute that you have it on, you have to then pan it off for four minutes. And then after you do that five times, it has to rest for three hours. Now, so that's basically five minutes of drill use, and you have to have a rest for three hours, according to them in their operations views. Another one, one minute on, four minutes off, and then five minutes. One minute on, four minutes off. And after three times for that drill, the model three, has to be a three hour rest. Another manufacturer is one minute on and five minute off. And what that is, is that if you go home back to your hospital and you look at the bottom of your drills, there'll be a stamp on it with this circle and this exclamation point on your drill. And if you match that, go to, if you find, if you can't find your operating manual, so you have to go to the and you open up the page for that thing, you will see a thing that's called duty cut. That's what that element is. And the duty cycle is the amount of time a drill can be used before it's required to cool down because the heat build up inside the drill. Now, if you don't follow the duty cycle, the manufacturer, when the drill fails, can say it's not there, you, you misuse the product, so the warranty doesn't track, <laughs> and you will have to pay for those repairs. And so you know, I encourage you. And what we did is when we went back, came back from going through an inspection, I went to my rep and I said, So, what's the tell me about duty cycle? I said, What's the duty cycle? And I said, Well, can you get one of your manuals out? Let's pull it up and learn about it together. And so he's reading it. He goes, Oh, wow. You know, well, that's not what they're taught in sales training is to talk about how you can only use the drill for a minute. Oh, the doctor, take my drill, my brain, and use it. Oh, you know, for a minute and then you have to let it rest for a minute. Nobody's selling that way. But from the company's perspective, from the legal perspective, they understand that the heat can build up and drill it in the instrument. So they're claiming that you should only use it in this, in this process. So uh, let's talk about the, another one uh, where somebody comes into you and says, oh, hey, you know what? We can save you money. Instead of buying regular scopes and having a whole bunch of regular scopes piled up on the shelves, why don't you spend a little bit more and get autoclavable scopes? So you can reduce your inventory and you can have these scopes turned over much quicker and you can use them. So autoclavable scopes can be flashed in an unlimited time without them being damaged. True or false? False. Absolutely. So each flash cycle subjects an instrument to 15 to 20 times stress, more stress than a normal sterilization. And while these instruments are manufactured to be able to survive an autoclavable cycle, um, the manufacturers recommend, again, in the, in the instruction book, they should only do it as an S resort. So again, you're being sold as a way to save money that you can buy these scopes and you don't have to have as many scopes on the shelf because you can turn them over quicker. But in actuality, you're putting these scopes at risk of being damaged if you use them, if you process them that way. So the reason that they get damaged is because there is an inner scope and an outer scope for this. David was kind of talking about some of the instrumentation. And they're held together by glue. They're basically sealed and they help get that group. And when you flash something, you're putting stress on those joints, those connection points, 
And because the hotter tube will heat up faster than the inner tube. And when you have one, you know, you know with heat, as heat expands, the, the, the tube, the outer tube expands, and the inner tube is staying constant, you stress the glue joints. And you can do that. Now it may be able to glue joint maybe for the last one, all the color cycle to one place, but the more you do it, the more stress there is, and eventually the glue, the glue separates and you start being water and damage inside the stone. And here's a Here's an example. So this is when you do normal sterilization, the blue graft is the heat of the outer of the outer shaft and the yellow is the inner. And as you can see with normal sterilization, they kind of track each other uh, going up in the heat in the same way. And so there's less stress that's putting on the, on the joints of the components. But when you flash, the outer the outer tube heats up almost immediately. You know, you get this this massive influx of heat that's going on to the tube. But the inner scope still is heating at a much slower rate. It takes time for that heat to penetrate. And so, while here the two joints, the two the two uh, tubes are, are basically functioning in the same pressure and stress, but for a matter of 15, 20, 30 seconds, you're putting a lot of pressure and stress, pulling one tube away from the other tube. And you're hoping that the glue that's holding them together will stay will stay uh, together. And so when that doesn't happen, then you have opportunities for fluid and other products to get inside. inside. So even though the tube is or the scope is designed to be flashable, by doing that you're actually shortening the life of the tube uh, to do that. And so you're actually counter being counterproductive by having less scopes and you're flashing them a lot. Than having the regular scopes that you process in the normal normal way, so that the scope will have longer life. Another urban legend: flashing saves time and money and power equipment. So, as we were just talking about, the flashing cycle will make not only the outside of a power instrument, you know, sterile, but the heat also transfers to the uh, inner aspect of the with the. With the uh, Electrical equipment is. Now, as we all know, we've all done it. We've gotten something that was flashed and we put it on the back table and someone pours water over to pull it down so that the surgeon can, can hold it in their hand. Well, you know, if you ever went outside in Las Vegas and you were having a nice cold drink, you would have the hot air on the outside and the cold fluid on the inside, what do you get on the outside of your glass? Condensation. And so, what happens many times when we do that, so we're making the drill hand being able to handled by the surgeon, we're creating condensation inside with electrical pieces of equipment. And if you go back, this is actually a picture I took in, in, uh, when I was at that repair facility of all these pieces that was inside the drill that shorted out because water condensation was inside the drill and uh, the drill had a thing. So um, the other thing that impacts when we do that is when we flash a, a power drill or something. We all remember we have the duty cycle. The duty cycle was designed to prevent the drill from overheating from the heat buildup inside the scope handle where the power, the power uh, section is on the scope. Well, if you already have a hot inside and you drill something, then the duty cycle is even less than a minute, one minute, and five minutes up. You already have a certain amount of heat built up in the handle. So that if you even try to use it during the normal expectations, you can still show it out and overheat the product, uh, the chips or the material inside, causing the drill to fail because of the fact that the duty cycle was even short further because of the heat inside the, uh, the handle. So um, one of the favorite things that I would always have in my dealings with my uh, they uh, 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 would always come back to me. would set the drill out and tell us that it's five thousand dollars to repair it. You know, to repair it. Like, wow, we just bought that six months ago. Well, user error. Your staff abused abused the product. And I would say, you know, I would sit there and say, you know, go back to my charge nurse in orthopedics or my charge nurse in, in gynae and general surgery or things like this. I'm like, what are you guys doing? You're killing me. You know, we have repair bills that are astronomical. And then I started realizing, like, how can it always be our fault? 
you would think in the base, you know, you put ten dollars in the machine, at least one time you're gonna win three dollars, three dollars back, you know. <laughs> you, you can't always lose because nobody would keep coming here. Sometimes you have your people can't be at fault. So um you know, I would actually set this up like one time, and this I'm gonna show this next slide because it was a thing that happened. I said to the my church, I said, these things are designed to work together. You know, you screw them on, you screw them off. Why why are we managing that? Well, with my friend when I turned this is is that he said many camper couplers are even made of aluminum. And he says aluminum is great if you're gonna screw something on and keep it there. But he said screwing it on and screwing it off, you don't know if you've ever seen the back of an air conditioner, those aluminum things are all that because aluminum is very valuable. And so because of the constant, even if your staff may not be paying hundred percent attention, the fact that people are, you know, going to case doing surgery on someone, you know, they're going to be screwing something on it and the screw it tight to make sure it's tight. The the product and material is not designed for repeated multiple screwing ons and screwing up. And so what the, the question that we really should be asking um, our vendors is, um, when you go to buy equipment is, what, what material is this made of? You know, one thing, what, you know, so here's a couple, you know, that steel or is that aluminum? The other question I started asking is, is what did your research and development tell you is the expected lifespan? How long can I expect this couple to work under normal use in use situations? And can you show me that test result? Because if there are be saying this is supposed to last two years and it's failing after six months, I want to be able to argue with them. Is how can how can this be happening in, in a different time frame? My favorite question was based on your repair history documentation, what percent of the time do you as a company classify? The, the damage as user, user. So if they came back to me and said, oh, you know, about 50% of the time. Well, if they're coming back to me every time saying 100% of the time is my staff's fault, then I'm gonna say, wait a second, are you saying that we're less than all the bariatric nurses in, in the rest of the country, we're 100%. So then that actually got me a lot of times that they covered it because I thought you can't be always us. If, if, you're, if your history shows that it's 50%, the other thing we did then is we started talking with the staff about the fact is that people may not even notice that that's a little problem. You know, we're going to say, hey, you got to be careful with these because these are these are designed not to be able to take a better care of maybe stainless steel or something else that you design. And so we would spend some time educating the staff. And this really came a lot out of our Just Culture initiative that we put in is that we're not going to be placing blame first. We're going to investigate, we're going to try to understand, and we're going to talk. And it really kind of lowered my anxiety level of seeing my repair budget account even ridiculously out of whack. And I actually was able to make some progress of uh, reducing that by having conversations with these vendors about those questions. But it also got my staff and everybody to relax that we weren't pointing fingers at each other. People wouldn't be, uh, be frustrated. Um, the other thing I, I would recommend if you're having a problem with a lot of repairs, phone them out, talk to your colleagues at other places, see if they're having the same issues. And then maybe form a joint venture or conversations with the representatives about how we should that here now we have two sides at the same problem where you're saying it's all it's our fault on how products and uh, and repair. So I want to step away a little bit about um, the power instruments and, the, and sort of talk a little bit about how uh, you kind of follow up what David was talking about is how you process instrumentation and how that can have uh, an effect on, uh, on our patient safety. And this was uh, from a talk that I heard uh, from uh, Dr. Alpha, who was a microbiologist up in Canada, where she, um, as part of her research um, interest, was looking at the failure rate of total alkoplastic alpha surgeries in Canada, why patients had to have their hips fail and had to have their dishes done. And so it sparked her interest and she started investigating this and uh, saw that there was a problem with how we are processing devices and, and, and implants 
that could impact on how patients are uh, the success of their surgery. So we know that implants are single-use devices, uh, and we know that part of implants include um, screws and, and, and drills and uh, the natural screen bits and um, plates and other things. And so, um, um, you know, it's we looked at that. And so squires, thank you, and that's uh, right there for me. If I look at my own slides. Uh, and you know, we, we know that they're made of steel and titanium and, and other polymers. And so uh, why would they be looking at how the processing impacts them and, and fails? So in her studies, when she was looking at this, they found that 51% of joint failures had to do with what they call a septic lucid, where for some reason, the implant was not connecting with the bone uh, or the tissue material that was trying to hold it together. And when they looked at that, one of the things that she looked at was how is, um, is there an impact from the way that we do surgery that could be uh, uh, influencing why there's a lack of adhesion between the, uh, the screws and the plates that are going inside. And so she did a study of instrumentation uh, with material, and this was before the material was made, and then this, this was after. And she found that many times the instruments were had more of a carbohydrate or an endotoxin or a lipid-based coating that was more of it actually after the processing or washing of the instrumentation. And she said a lot of that had to do with what type of water you have. Do you have hard water or soft water? How well the, auto, the, the automatic washer is, is it maintained properly? Is it clean properly? Is it rinsing effectively? Because again, some people just say it's working, there's no alarm sounding. So the thing maybe while the washer still has maybe working, we have to be working at full efficiency. And it's as David talked about, there's sometimes a film that can be left. Now, like when we talked about the Duke thing, people could actually feel it because it was elevated for it. But that's something that when things are rinsed, it's not really rinsing anything off. And so many times there's a, a soap film is left on the, on the instruments that are being put in place. And so she did an experiment putting titanium pins in rats, and they had titanium pins that had no particles out of, fresh out of, fresh out of the bag, fresh out of the manufacturer, and after six weeks of surgery, they had 20% bone adherence. But then she had some with just with some particles on it, and it went down to 12%, uh, and then she had the ones with the biowork products that she was finding. Uh, she washed those titanium pins through the uh, washer sterilizer and uh, automated cleaning, and so they had those uh, lipid-based products, and they were only 5% bone inherent. And so because of this film that was covering these pins and these plates, there was less likelihood that there was going to, the, the metal could, could, the bone could adhere to the pin, and you could have um, loosening and uh, the product failing. So she did, um, took some tissue samples, and as you can see, and you actually saw this in the, it almost looks exactly the same as when David, or in his last talk, the corrosion inside the Yankar suctures, remember she was kind of pointing out, it almost looked exactly the same. So here is some co corrosion particles that are in the patient's tissue, and these little dark spots here, pieces of metal. So the implant is corroding away and causing an inflammation in the patient's skin. When you have inflammation, it swells. And then when the inflammation goes down, it shrinks. And now you have a space where the implant can, can loosen and, and fall apart. Which made me think about this is that, you know, our synthesis trays, we have what? 100 screws sitting on that tray. And in surgery, maybe we use two, three, four, five. And then we send the tray down for washing, come back up, use it another day, two, three, four, or five, send it down to washing. There could be synthy screws and some of my trays that have been there through hundreds and hundreds of cycles of sterilization, uh, first being washing, getting the biofilm for them, and then secondly, going to steam sterilization. So this is a picture of a brand new screw right out of, right out of, uh, right out of the marketplace. 
This is one cycle of going to, of going to steam sterilization. And you can see already, just a little bit, this is five cycles of steam sterilization, and this is 10 cycles of steam sterilization. And as you can see, every single time, the screw is going through the washing sterilizing process and then going through an autoclave, it's corroding the, the metal a little bit more. And so this, this is microscopic views of that screw. And you can see, we're, we're wondering where the little black particles of metal are coming from. Coming from the screw that we're putting in that might have been processed over and over and over again, leaving the patient with a with the screw that's basically shredding its material into the tissue surrounding uh, the patient's uh, implant. And as we know, whenever you get a foreign body inside the patient, the body's going to react, try to do something about this, cause inflammation, cause swelling, you know, cause that pain that the patient would be talking about with the implant, and then cause it to fail prematurely because of the fact that it doesn't adhere to the bone and is loosening around it. And until I heard this talk, I never once did anyone ever speak to me about the fact that we're washing and sterilizing these, these over and over and over and over again. I mean, and I couldn't even tell you if I looked at that tray how many times, right? There could be a screw in there. I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying. I just, there could be a screw in there for three years ago, four years ago. You know, especially the, the, the weird ones, the big ones and the really small ones. We have no tracking of how often. Uh, that happens. And I really, it's like, well, you know, there's, there's literature that's coming out that's saying you should, you should go to single, you know, package device screws. Yeah, not from the manufacturers, it's just coming from uh, researchers. I know, like, I'm already a spine surgery, so that this feature is in and out. Yeah. They weren't done it. What's in the do they put it back in the tray and they go back after use? They shouldn't be putting them. They should be. Totally, yeah. yeah, they should be. They should be supposed to be single use. Yeah. When you're talking about this, I don't know anything about the vehicle and the self-washing concept, but it looks like it's clean and it's all the Yeah. Yeah. And again, you run it through the car wash and it looks clean, but you can still see some Right. Right. So that's what's saying that the, the, the you know, the automatic washer just are not going to totally remove the, it's going to look clean. Right. Yeah. But there's going to be a little, my step level, a little bit of film. And then, of course, when it gets subjected to water and heat, you know, the water and the heat is going to have a steam sterilization, it's going to have an impact on the metal. And so, when it looks, when you look at it, it looks like you put the totally smooth screw in place. But depending on, you know, let's think if that's 10 cycles. Just think if you put a screw in that had been in 50 cycles or, or 100 cycles. And so I, I do believe the literature I was looking at is that there is talk, not coming from the manufacturers, but there is talk that maybe you should be going to pack single individual pack screws as opposed to bringing 100 screws in to a room and using five of them. Well, like we're so concerned with the uh, like hole in our like an outside Right. And, and we don't even have knowledge of yeah. And I was actually, after I learned, I was actually embarrassed to admit that I could not tell anybody how long each of those groups had been in the trip. So, you know, it is, um, it is a, it is a challenge to, uh, uh, you know, we get into this process, right? So when I was trained in orthopedic surgery, the, you know, the, Nurse said, okay, here's the synthesis tray set. You know, we sterilize it after you're done. You go into the room, you pull the sides of the screws that you need to use, you replace them back in, and then you send it down, send it down as feet. <laughs> the process. Never once did it talk about what about all the other screws. You know, I always thought that when it went through the washer sterilizer, it was still it was clean. There was nothing there's no residue, there wasn't anything left about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so it's, it just really opened my eyes that what I thought was best practice and what I was trained to do actually isn't because somebody took the time to say, why are we having so many, why are, why are hips, like she said, why was hips failure being because of the prosthesis weakening? Why wasn't it attaching to the bone? And, you know, when she started investigating, it, 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 I just remember sitting in the audience going, oh my God, I never 
never even really thought of that. So she was nice enough to allow me to to use her slides to uh, to go ahead and, and bring this forward. So here's a, another picture of a, a screw, and this is from a Surgical Materials Testing Laboratory, and this is a, a, a picture of a new brand new unprocessed screw. And then alongside two inches of screws that undergone processing on numerous occasions. And once again, you can see that the uh, the screw is being impacted um, by the uh, by the uh, process, heat processing and the and the sterilization process. And again, our eyes can't see it, but it's it's there. And then if we go back, you know, that's those holes and those little breaks, those little things are causing these pieces of metal. It's up and then even a little bit of corrosion and getting into the patient's tissue uh, surrounding them. So you know, once our system is treated enzyme trainers on the metal that causing it to be paradise? Yeah, so they, they also uh, leave a coating of uh, a basic carbohydrate-based protein. That, that's one process part of it. The other process is the diffusion of the metal. So you really change two factors taking into the fact there that you can have a screw that has a lot of lipid based particles on it and corrosion on it. Both the Can you mention about the water? Which water source was the most important? Hard water is hard water. the, the oh, yeah, because yeah. it, you know, and that's where a lot of times you take a shower in hard water and you can feel the soap still out. Oh, yeah. So, you know, you really should understand what type of water is going through and do you need a softening treatment to help get rid of some of those. Some of those particles. Yeah. And I know, like on the ultrasonic painters, you have the different types of metals in there. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk about two for the audience. So, and there are two different types too. Do you have an opinion on the thing? About the different metals? Yeah. Yeah, you're supposed to combine different metals. What happens is that you have a mask and you send a single metal and then you have to combine the different metals to get rid of the different So, you sometimes. Yeah. And I, and I have to say, I would sometimes. You know, you, I would call it the soup, you know, because they would have the ultrasonic cleaner and people would put trays stuff in there. And I'm like, how often do you guys change that? You know, I don't, you know, understand the SPD processing, but I kind of like, just like, a, don't you, you change it every time? <laughs> because there's a lot of instruments going into that thing to go through that ultrasonic uh, thing cycle. Like you know, I think it's been to is that interesting way to look at surgical side infections too? Mm -hmm. Where when I think was talking about implants, but mm -hmm. the way that our instruments may look at yeah. the microscope and look at so much usage. Right, and you could you know edit that. She didn't. She did this with implants. Right. But I wonder if you took a look at Kelly's and, and uh, scissors and other things that they have still had the little fine shards that are happening. Those little those little corrosive effects that are happening that we don't see, and uh, and and it's an impact. But you know, it's the the idea here is that we should, you know, we, we get into we get this mindset that we're experts, right? We are experts. You know, we do amazing things. You know, we we touch people in the most intimate way possible and change their futures. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, we're changing your future for the better, right? We're giving someone who has a variety of arthritic hip. Just think of that life that person has. And constant pain, and the life of their family has to live with this person. Constant pain. They probably don't go out, enjoy life. They don't go to movies, they don't go to plays, they don't go to that. We come in, we fix their head, they go home, they can walk, they're pain free. You know, living with someone in pain which is not the best thing. You know, you have to really have wealth there. And now, so this person is a different person, they're pain free. Their life has changed, but also the life of the family that has to be directed. And we, we do that miracle helping people to have a different life. Now, we can also do great now, right? If we have people not paying attention or, or we, we just trust the processes are going to work without asking the questions. The one thing about being a healthcare practitioner, I'm a nurse, so I'm going to speak at it from a nursing perspective, is a large part of what I do is technical. I make sure the instruments are ready and things are in place. A large part of what I do is I care for this person as a human being when the operating room is probably the most dehumanized experience that anybody ever goes through. Right? We strip them with the clothes, we put them in a bed naked with 
strange and well known, and we're in a touch and the most intimately possible. And that's a huge leap of faith for someone, so I have to care for them about that. But the third thing I have to be as a scientist, I have to look at things and say, is there a better way? You know, there's a lot of people who just do things because someone told me 20 years ago, and we really have to step back. And the problem with nursing is nursing, it takes 10 years from the nursing scientist discovery to being adopted in the practice. So we have to speed that up. I think our problem as a profession is a huge gap between the science, the scientists of nursing and the academics and those of us in operation. We don't tend to talk as much. I would talk to my department of surgery chairman, who was also a professor at Northwestern University School of Medicine, and I would say, Dr. Winchester, we want to look at doing things about ways to uh, implement the uh, timeout process and method. He goes, well, let me talk to the dean of medical school. I'm like, why are you talking to the dean? You're the chairman of surgery. But he always said, the dean in the medical school in the residence training program always influenced how they were going to do things in the operating room. I never talked to the dean of the school of nursing, you know, at Loyola University. <laughs> Medical center. We never talk to the dean. Let's go ask the dean of nursing if we're going to make a change in nursing process. But I think you know the physician relationship with science and medicine. They still keep that relationship many times. But we as in we go we went here from nursing school. Ninety percent of us never donate even to our alumni cooperate. They just kind of graduate and go out. But there's a lot of science that's out there. That, uh, you guys are here at Hamburg, so if you're on the you're on the good side, but you just please mix this the lounge visit. We never go, we never go to campus again, or never pick up a journal, never take anything. They what they do has life and death impact. I was actually an expert witness on a case where a 20-year-old woman came in for a hysteroscopy, two-year-old child, 22-year-old husband. The nurses who assigned the case didn't go to the inserts. They stayed in the lounge and were drinking coffee or whatever. Three weeks later, they were assigned to the case and they felt that they were experienced owners and that they could figure it out. One way they hit the hip, they hooked the hysteroscope up backwards and pumped gas into the middle instead of fluid, causing an error in the ballistic pillar. So now, you know, because they it was a job, you know, it became a job for them. What they do is a job. You know, I came in. I think we were both very no our nurses. You know, I've done thousands of cases. I know how to take this new piece of equipment out. Well, now a 22 woman is dead. A two year old boy is going to grow up without a mother. And a 22 year old young man is now a widower trying to raise a child with a single family member because someone didn't take what they do and said, let's let me go and learn and let me talk more um, after that. And so, this is the, the my hope is. Is that it, first off, it's not what we're being told. It's, you're not abusing the product. Sometimes it's the way the product is designed. And you have to have that conversation before you buy it to make sure that you have some guidelines and you the rep. And two, it's not always what the rep tells you. Hey, you have to ask some questions. Yeah, you know, it has this great torque, it has this great feel, you know, look at this, oh, look at that sexy design, you know, to the thing. Well, what about the duty cycle? What's the duty cycle? Yeah. They don't, they're not being told that, but they're told to, to get people to buy it. What's the thing? Right, so asking those questions, having those conversations, not only will protect your budget, but also protect your patient, protect your staff, and you know, having kids buckets take the cost of it, and none of that's what's in <laughs> So I think it's time to think about how we manage the whole surgical process inventory and how we look at screws that are being processed how we look at the cleaning process, because all of those, even though it's it's behind the scenes that that young lady, for those of you who were David Spock was talking about, barbers need to be licensed, other people need to be licensed, but not surgical bench, they're just as important to the surgical process as those of us at the tip of the spear actually doing the surgery. And we have to have a trust that the whole process all the way through is, is at its most optimal. So uh, what you can do is, you know, test your uh, washer disinfectants, see if they're clean properly. How well is it rinsing? Is it up to speed? Um, I don't know, you know, prevent and maintenance, how do you have a prevent and maintenance contract? And then when they do that, I get a report about what they found and, is, and what may have uh, 
uh, need to happen. And sure, the final rinse water is the, the right quality. If it's hard water, you need to get a water softener put in place so that it can help reduce the bio burden that's being left. And then uh, look at packaging the plates and screws, which I know would be very resisted by the screw industry because it's going to cost them a lot more money to be able to do that. But if there's plenty of evidence that shows that sterilization and washing is damaging the screws, we would not have to have that conversation. So when the instruments are ready, uh, the, the team functions better and the patients remain safe. And uh, isn't that why we're here? All right, guys, I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, you know, that would be, again, in the... Yeah. I know your hospitals do it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, but I would, you know, so at least for the, like, the uh, uh, motorized equipment, that should be all in your uh, in, uh, use, uh, instructions for use manuals. So that, you know, but I know a lot of times, uh, for example, I would uh, say to the OR manager, when I became chief nursing officer, I'd say, the OR manager, why are you $150,000 over budget? She said, oh, you know, the that's for the preventive maintenance. We forgot to do that last year, and so we didn't, there was no expense, so that's why it wasn't budgeted this year. And I'm like, wait, you forgot to do preventive maintenance. <laughs> and for those of you who heard my talk on Sunday, the problem that we face is that there's so many problems coming to us that we get distracted, right? You really have to have an organized method to make sure, or have somebody delegated to make sure that the preventive maintenance is happening, uh, that people are following the, the changing of the water in the instrument tank because there's so many things to remember, you know, and human factor says that brain can only remember so many things and then when you add something on, something falls off. And so we really have to help, you know, have structures in place that can make sure that we don't forget when preventing maintenance done and, and don't forget when things need to be changed. And so going to instruments, that, that, that would be a conversation with the representative. Now, of course, the problem is, no, no, I'm talking about regular instrument. Even like, so your VB rep or somebody, you know, say, hey, how often, is, how, you know, is your, hold on one second, is your scissors, how long is it supposed to last? Yes, sir. I was just going to say, you've got to buy a medical engineering department, which we can call them that one. Yeah, yeah. We've got, I work for Vermont Healthcare, yeah. and I'm the assistant director of the Secretary. We've got all of our instruments, all of our medical equipment, all those devices are in the asset management right. program. Right, yep. The schedules, yeah, and they have to make sure they get them all. You know, uh, one day we counted how many instant, how many pieces of equipment an operating room nurse needs to work, be able to work if she's going to be if she's going to get caught. It came out to over 450 different pieces of technology based on all the different specialties. Now, you know, we were community hospitals, so we didn't have our team on call, we didn't have our team team on call, we didn't have our neurosurgery team on call, like many of the academic medical centers had. So our nurses had to come in and be able to do a lot of different things. And, you know, it, it was a tough ask, but if you're a neurosurgeon, middle of the night, you're saying to the Northern Peter, I'm not great for Kusa, she goes, I don't know, why is it? You know, it's great for us, it's fun. So, uh, but there's all this, that's what we fought so much to keep our in-service training going that we would give time for opportunities to people to train them to piece of equipment and try to rotate that. But having making sure by that knows that all that equipment is there and tracking um, to the because a lot of hospitals are outsourcing that to uh company. Okay, great. Thanks for coming.